Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about wills. Uh, wills are the records that people leave about what they want to have happen to their property after they die. Um, this is going to be just a really beginner level course for those of you who haven't used wills before. We're going to review a couple of examples, um, but I also want to talk about them in the context of a larger genealogical concept, which is probate records. So I'll spend a couple of minutes talking about what is in a probate file, and then we'll look at some examples of some wills and what they can do for you. Now, why are we talking about this right now? Well, first of all, there are quite a few wills and will abstracts available already on Ancestry.com. Um, I think I... I checked earlier and I think it's like 14 million of them. And so um, we want you to be using those because they're really like this really rich genealogical source, um, particularly for families prior to 1850 um, when the census records become really scant. And so um, I want you to be using them. I want you to become familiar with them. The other reason is that a little more than a year ago, our CEO announced at the Roots Tech Conference that Ancestry.com over the course of the next several years will be digitizing and indexing an entire probate, all the probate records currently available for the United States. Um, in conjunction with FamilySearch. FamilySearch has microfilmed all those records. Ancestry.com is going to digitize and index those and put them online. And so we just want you to, to become familiar with them because you're going to start seeing those come online here shortly and we want you to be using them. So let's review uh, what uh, is included in probate files and then we'll look at some examples of some wills. Let's dive in. <clears throat> Let's talk about probate records. So a probate file uh, is what many of you are going to find if you went to a county courthouse and asked for a probate file about your ancestor. Here are some of the things you're going to find in that. First of all, you're going to find wills. If somebody left a will, that means that um, they, they were a testator, that they um, created a document that listed what they wanted done with their property. Now, if they did not create a will, that means they died intestate, but that doesn't mean that there won't still be a file. So just because they didn't create a will doesn't mean um, that a file doesn't exist. So there's lots of other things included in that, pro in that probate file. Another thing would be an appointment of executors or administrators. So who is going to ex um, be the executor of this will? Who's going to be the administrator of the property? Okay. Um, a petition for guardianship will be included likely in that probate file. If the person who died had underage children, even if the mother of those children was still living, there would be a petition for guardianship. Now the mother might be appointed as the guardian. The purpose of this is not like we think of guardianship now. The purpose of guardianship is to make sure that the children's um, that the children are represented in the process of probating this person's estate to make sure that their needs are, um, are represented. You will also likely find in a probate file an estate inventory. Whether the person died with a will or without a will, uh, their property still needs to be properly inventoried so that, um, so that it's known or understood what needs to be distributed. And then that brings us to the next thing, which is um, the distribution of assets. Whether that distribution of assets is in accordance with the will or if there was no will, if it needs to be determined, there's going to be um, likely an inventory of that. Now, who's going to have a probate file? Both men and women will likely have probate files um, uh, and oftentimes even wills. Even though there are times and places in history where women were not allowed to own property in the sense of land, um, sometimes they still had, um, had things in their own possession that they could will or that they needed to will. It uh, is for people who are landowners or not. So just because you think that your family was poor um, and did not own land, which is usually the, the equation there, uh, does not mean that they won't have a probate file or a will. They still might. And the biggest um, benefit of these uh, for genealogical purposes is to look for some of those relationship clues. So let me just show you where on Ancestry.com you're going to find these records, and then let's take a look at a couple of examples. So on Ancestry.com, you're going to go to the 
um, ever useful card catalog. If you hover over search, card catalog is going to be the bottom option. Go ahead and click on that. Let me make my screen a little bit bigger here. There we go. Over here on the left hand side, you're going to see filters by collection. Okay, and you're probably used to those. You've probably used them at some point. But we're going to come down here to tax, criminal, land, and oh, look, there it is, wills. Okay, click on that. That's going to uh, narrow or filter your list of databases down from 30 some odd thousand to 1100 and some. Okay, now we can continue to filter further down to wills, estates, and guardian records. And that's going to take us down to 369 databases. Now the card catalog always filters by popularity. You can change that to filter it alphabetically or put the newest stuff on the top of the list. It's up to you. Or you can just continue to use these filters over here. You have the option to filter by location or to filter by date. And you can do that by century or by decade, either one. So that's how the card catalog works. In this case, um, we're just going to take a look at a few different titles here so that I can explain to you what some of the different kinds of things are that you're going to see. This top collection here, 12.7 million records, it is a national probate calendar for England and Wales. It starts in 1858 and it goes through 1966. Now a probate calendar, we've put this in parentheses here so that you understand, is just an index of the wills and administrations. It's not an actual copy of those exact records. And so I can do a search in here and I can see, um, let's just pull up an example here. This is going to be a published book that is an abstract or an index of the records that um, that are the actual wills and probate files. Keep in mind that actual wills and probate files can be anywhere from, you know, one to 60 or 80 or 100 pages long. And so to, to digitize the full probate files is no small task. And so in the case of England, what the, what the country did, what the National Archives did, um, they created these probate calendars so that people could know that a, that a probate file existed so that they could have a general idea of what was included in it and if this was their person or not, so that they could then order the original file or go, go to the record office to look at the original file. So here is what a, what a probate calendar or um, abstract looks like. So we have a woman named Eleanor Abel. Her address is 13 Greyfriars Road in Norwich. She's a spinster, that means she was um, not married. She died the 3rd of June 1964 in Helliston Hospital in Norwich um, and the probate was done in Norwich in, on the 29th of June um, and Leonard William Frosdick was the representative and she had 788 pounds. So just really simple but it's, the point is to give you just enough information to know if this is your person um, in order to, to order this file. Now some have a little bit more information. In this case, this woman, Dorothy Elizabeth Abel, it lists that her, it lists her husband's name. Um, this one here, Doris Abel, it lists that she's a widow so that you know that her husband predeceased her. So there are, even in these abstracts, there are oftentimes clues to additional relationships or to additional information about the family, okay? So um, always pay attention, even if it's just an abstract or an index, it still has a lot of value. It gives you some information, but then the point is to then use this information to go obtain a copy of the original where it exists. Now in some of these cases, the original no longer exists. So this particular set of records is England and Wales, um, and it's the Court of Canterbury Wills. They date back to 1384, and they go through 1858. Now I'm just going to pull up one of these um, just to let you see exactly what it is that we're looking at here. Here's one from 1823, and you're going to very quickly see that... Um, that first of all, they're all rewritten into a book. So these are not copies, these are not the originals, nor are they even really, uh, well, they're not like what we consider copies of the originals. They're handwritten copies of the originals put into this book. And some of them are written in this fancy old English, 
and so they're a little bit more tricky to read. <clears throat> Once you take a course or two, or there's a couple of online resources where you can learn to read Old English handwriting, it makes perfect sense, <laughs> but um, until you do that, this might look a little bit just like chicken scratch. So um, be, be aware that you can read them if you just learn a few things, but um, these are going to have some really great information. A lot of them are very boilerplate, meaning they have some of the exact same language, which is actually good because it means if you can learn what some of that boilerplate language is for uh, you know an old Canterbury will, then you'd be able to quickly read through some of the things um, that are boilerplate, and then you'd be able to pick out additional information here. Like here it says she was the wife of William Bywater, um, it lists the county, it lists the job that he was engaged in, a cotton manufacturer. Um, she publishes her last will and testament in writing. You, you start to see, you start to be able to pick out some of that information that's going to be useful for you. So um, those are the Canterbury wills. Now, I'm going to scroll down here just a little bit. We have some um, what we call blended collections because that's the way Ancestry.com received them from the record holder. In this case, we're looking at Virginia land, marriage, and probate records from 1639 through 1850. Now, I've told many of you this before, but if you're new, let me just um, let you know how this works. Anytime you come to a database on Ancestry.com, before you start searching it, I always encourage you to scroll past that search box read the database description and the source information. This is going to tell you where Ancestry obtained this information and it's also going to give you some information about what's included and how to search them. So in this case it's going to tell us that this data set includes more than 65,000 abstracts of wills so we know they're abstracts not copies of the originals um, from Augusta County with some years Isle of Wight County for a set of years and Norfolk County for a set of years. So it does not include the entire state of Virginia. That's the first thing to know. It includes these three counties. Then it, the counties have different coverage years and that's also important to understand. So this database description is going to give you some really, really valuable information before you start searching. Okay, so we're going to come back up here then and I'm going to search again. I just use, I oftentimes I do this actually, even when I come to search for myself, I'll do a search for Smith, <coughs> excuse me, because I know that it's likely to have a record for somebody with the name of Smith, just to give me an idea of how the records are organized. Okay. Now, one of the other things you might notice is when you're doing database specific searches, these particular records are going to, um, the, the search box is going to be specific to this collection of records. So you're going to see things like a prove date or, uh, you know, a a um, proved location, property information, occupations. Those are the kinds of things that were indexed in this particular collection. So we're going to include them on the search form for you. Um, I'm just going to do a search for a last name just because, again, I'm trying to see what comes up, what's familiar here. Um, you're going to see things like um, a description or a descriptor word over here. In this case, the word is executrix. That tells me that this particular record is a will mentioned, probably a will, a deceased landowner, probably a will, an heir, a grantor, a patentee. You're going to see all of those different kinds of um, things, witnesses. Those are the kinds of words that you need to start to become familiar with in order to read a will so that you understand who all the people are that are involved. Here's a decedent. That's the person that has passed away. Um, neighbor, daughter, right? Like all sorts of different little notations here about who these people are. Now one of the things you're going to notice here is that these records, some of them date back a long time. And that is one of the benefits of probate records is that they've been kept. As long as people have owned property, they have had to make some kind of accommodation for what would happen to that property after they passed away. Okay, we're going to look at one more here, and that's these New Jersey abstracts of wills. And this will be, um, an abstract is a little bit different than an index. An abstract has oftentimes more information than just an index. So we're going to look at an abstract for a will of one of my ancestors here. This is Richard Lippincott. The, the um, date on this record is the 23rd of November uh, 1683 in Shrewsbury, New Jersey. 
one of the things you're going to notice here, they're uh, typed. There was not um, that capacity back then, right? They're also all the same, one right after another. It's because this is a reprint of New Jersey colonial documents, okay? This happens to just be a volume, uh, a published volume. That is because the originals likely no longer exist, or if they do exist, they are probably in cold storage with some archive. So um, the abstract may be the closest to the original that I'm able to get. And so this becomes really important to me. But it's also important to understand that it is an abstract, that it was published years later, um, and that because that introduces some room for error. So I need to just look at it through those eyes. Now, here's this November 23rd, 1683, Richard Lippincott of Shrewsbury, will of. Um, so it's the will of Richard Lippincott of Shrewsbury. His wife's name is listed as Abigail. His sons are listed as Jacob, Freedom, Remembrance, John, and Restore with a daughter named Incarnation. Now, interestingly enough, they've um, whoever created this abstract put the word increase in parentheses with a question mark. That could be because they couldn't read the name, or it could be because this man's family is well documented and they knew that his daughter's name was Increase, but it may say Incarnation on the actual record. Uh, he had land at Long Point. He had personal property. His wife was the executrix of his will. The witnesses were Hugh Dickman and Judah Allen. It was acknowledged by the testator before Joseph Parker, the Justice of the Peace, as his testament the same day. That was the 23rd of November, 1683. Okay. Now you're going to see some additional information. The, the person in bold is the person for the record, who the record is for. And then if you just scroll down, you're going to see other dates as other things happen with this estate. Remember back to our probate file. The will is just one part of a probate file. There are additional things that occur before that probate is closed. And so oftentimes what you're going to see are these other things that happen as this will is probated. Um, and so pay attention to all of that information. But this abstract, it, even if the original will no longer exists, this abstract gives me quite a bit of information. Information about his wife and his children and their relationships. Also pay attention to these witnesses. Very often witnesses are going to be sons-in-law or brothers-in-law or other close family members, people that they trust, that know them, um, or it could be people that they work with or worship with. So pay attention to those witnesses, the names of those witnesses, make note of them, look for them, see who they are and how they are possibly related to the family. Do the same thing if you see the names of um, bondsmen. In this case, we've got um, two bondsmen here for this particular uh, probate and look and see who inventoried the estate. Again, check and see if those uh, people are related, if those are clues that might help you discover who the daughters were married to or who sisters were married to in that particular family, maybe even um, brothers of the wife, so it might be a clue to her maiden name. So even just with, a, with a, an abstract like we have here, uh, there's still a lot of really rich information about this person. Now, one other will I want to take a look at. This is actually um, a record that I was not able to copy. I wasn't able to create a copy of it, but I was able to, um, to do an abstract. Or actually, I, I did a transcription of it. Not just an abstract, but I actually copied it word for word. And so I've put that into the notes here in Family Tree Maker for this person. And let me just read through it. It's going to help you understand some of the language or some of the ways in which wills are constructed. So this is from 1739, um, and it starts out like many wills do. In the name of God, amen, I, Tobias Phillips of Richmond County, being in perfect memory, do appoint this my last will and testament. And then we have what are called items. An item is... Um, just a specific thing he's going to note. And so this is how it was written. Item, I give to my son George Phillips, Negro Bowain or Bookwain, it was hard to read, and the use of my Negro wench Fortimer until she shall be delivered of three children. Her firstborn I give to my daughter Elizabeth, her second to William Dale the Younger, the third to my daughter Hannah, and then the property to vest my son George. Item, I give to my wife Hannah, the use of my servants Joseph Peckton and Thomas Lawrence during her widowhood, and after to my son George. 
<coughs> excuse me, item I give to my daughter, Frances Dale, one barren cow. Uh, item, I leave all the remainder of my estate to be equally divided between my loving wife, my son George, and my two daughters, Elizabeth and Hannah. I order my son George, pay Thomas Lawrence 500 pounds of tobacco for his freedom dues. Um, item, my will is that the care of my son George's estate and his tuition shall be to my, and then there was a big smear in the page, um, during my wife's widowhood after her marriage to William Glassrock. I constitute and appoint my loving wife and William Glassrock, my executor of this, my last will and testament, for witnesses hereunto I have set my hand and seal this 10 day of September, 1739, Tobias Phillips. And then it lists the witnesses, Godfrey Wilcox, William Forster, and Mary Howard. And then this particular will was... Um, proved in open court in April of 1740. So what that tells me is that Tobias Phillips died sometime between the 10th of September, 1739, when he made the will, and the 7th of April, 1740, when the will was proved. Okay, so that's another huge benefit of, of wills, is that if you can see when the will was created and when the will was proved, you know that the person died between those two dates. And for some people, particularly as you start getting back into the 17 and 1600s, that may be the closest you get to a death date. There may be no record of the actual date on which they died. There may be no surviving tombstone. And so this may be as good as it gets. So very often what I will do is I will put in the place of the death date field, I will put before 7 April 1740 so that I um, understand that that's that's the closest death date I'm going to be able to to come up with. Um, there was also an estate inventory that was done of this particular family, um, and that's on file. And I'm so excited because I'm actually going to um, Virginia in a month, a month and a half, and, for the National Genealogical Conference, and I'll be um, hopefully looking that up while I'm there. So uh, hopefully you caught some of the other clues here in this particular record. First of all, um, he is he has slaves. And so knowing that he's a slave owner tells me that there is likely additional information, maybe some property information, um, some bills of sale, some additional information that I can find there about this person. Now, this particular person um, also lists some children, Elizabeth, Hannah, and George, and then a daughter, Frances. Well, Frances is listed as Frances Dale. So not only does it list her name, but it lists what is likely her married name. Okay, it, it further bears out in that she, he gave to William Dale the Younger, um, one of the slave children. And so that leads me to believe that William Dale is likely the son of Francis Dale. He didn't think much of Francis. He gave her a barren cow. But William apparently holds a little bit um, higher value in this man's eyes. Now, um, he also has not just slaves, um, Negro slaves, but he also has servants. And this is where this particular will was of interest to me. Thomas Lawrence is one of my ancestors. Um, and Thomas Lawrence had a mother whose name was Margaret or Maggie Lawrence. Maggie Lawrence was from England and she um, committed a crime. She was sentenced uh, to prison. She was in prison. And while in prison, um, she was further sentenced to be shipped to America as an indentured servant. And Tobias Phillips is the man who purchased her indentureship. And so um, she was his servant. She did not uh, live very much longer after she got to the United States. However, she had two children, uh, two sons, John and Thomas. And we are very, um, we're, we're pretty certain that Tobias Phillips fathered her two children. So he thought, um, you know, and as we read and as I've looked into the estate of this man, um, we think that he likely fathered children by his Negro slaves, um, not just his indentured servants as well. So uh, the, he was not a pleasant man. I've got some other records where he actually directs, uh, he actually states who he wants his wife to marry. Um, oh, it's actually right here in the will. Um, during my wife's widowhood and after her marriage, um, th there's some things that um, he says about how he wants things to be run. Very controlling um, man and Anyway, you start to see some of those personality clues come out in wills as well about how they want things to be done. Um, in this case, 
<clears throat> he was very clear about his son George going to school, that his tuition would be paid and that that would be taken care of. Um, he talks about how um, he wants Thomas to, to have uh, his freedom dues be paid out in tobacco, which was a form of currency at the time in Virginia. Again, lots of different clues you're going to find in these wills. Sometimes all you're going to find is um, an abstract. Sometimes all you may find is a written copy of the will. The original may no longer exist. But always in family history, the, clue, the key is you get as close to the original as you can because that's going to give you the best information. And these, um, always pay attention to those witnesses and to the executors and to the guardians and to the people who inventoried the estate. Um, look to those people for relationship clues as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, Ancestry.com has about 14 million probate records, indexes, abstracts, um, and originals on our website currently. Many of those, actually most of those, are for England. However, it was announced a year ago that Ancestry.com over the next several years will be uh, digitizing and indexing a complete U.S. probate um, complete U.S. probate records that have been microfilmed by Family Search that will be digitized and indexed and placed on Ancestry.com over the course of the next few years. And I just wanted to get you ready for that, um, have you start looking at wills and, and thinking about them and seeing what clues you can derive from them, because when those records go online, I think a lot of us, myself included, are going to be spending a lot of time looking through those records, and I don't want you to miss a single clue in the records once they're available to you. Uh, that's all I have prepared for you today. If you're watching this at our regularly scheduled time, I will be on chat in just a few minutes to um, answer any additional questions you might have. If you want to learn more about probate records, just Google probate and genealogy, and you'll find several articles written by several uh, professional genealogists who do a lot of work with these kind of records, and it'll maybe take your education to the next level. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.